I walked outside and thought, brr. I really couldn't think anything else. <laughs> I got up this morning and, and, and had to run to the store. I went and got the kids some donuts for Valentine's Day. And I, like I have most mornings, I threw on my sweatshirt and just ran outside and didn't start my truck first. I just got in it and literally drove to Harps from my house like this. <laughs> so cold and so uh, I am from Michigan and I hate this with every ounce of my fiber uh, just so everybody knows those of you who have been praying for a snow day cut it out stop it <laughs> stop all right it's enough I have seen somebody post this morning they're like oh it doesn't look like we're going to get as much as possible that must mean I'm closer to Jesus than you are because <laughs> Because I've been praying <laughs> this, that we would have a, some sort of miraculous parting of the snowstorm and it hit every place in Missouri and Little Rock. And then everything in here, I'm good. Just leave it alone. I'm fine. So, but if you do have a snow day tomorrow, I pray that you enjoy it with your kids or, or just enjoy watching it with some hot chocolate or whatever. I, I pray that you stay safe above all. Uh, somebody this morning, I'm going to tell on her, Olivia, that sang with us this morning, she, she posted and she said, oh, I don't know if anything could get me out of bed this morning knowing it was so cold. And I just commented real subtly. I said, uh, how about a resurrection? And uh, she's here. She's got up this morning. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, but I'm glad that you are here. I know a lot of people had to travel and wasn't sure about safety. Uh, Miss Brittany Race plays drums for us. And you guys know little Brittany. I, uh, she looks like Animal back here when she plays the drums. Got that little ponytail bobbing and stuff. Her family actually live outside of Springfield, Missouri. And they, she drives down. To, to play and to play with our worship team and, and to be with us. And so she wasn't able to be with us this morning, so I appreciate her uh, and her family's safety, but also appreciate Briston jumping in and helping last minute this morning. Uh, give it up again for the worship team this morning, if you would. So, John chapter 13. As you guys are turning there, I want to just step into this briefly before I get into the sermon. A lot of you know, a lot of you weren't aware, uh, Jim Hines, who is one of our volunteer leaders here at the church who was on our executive team, which is our highest level of leadership here at the church. Uh, That's my advisory board, basically, is how that works. Is um, the, Those are the guys I get to dream with. And uh, Jim went into the hospital uh, about a month back and, with COVID and passed this week and uh, lost that battle, but he is, he is winning another one right now. And, uh, and I, those of you that know Jim... I don't have to tell you the type of impact that he had in our church, from life groups to our internship to just personal relationships that he had. I was telling Matt this morning when he came and asked me how I was doing, Jim, Jim isn't only somebody that attended our church. Jim was a great friend to me. Uh, he was an answer to prayer when he didn't know he was. Uh, I had been praying when we started growing. I said, God, I need, some, I need help with leadership development. I need somebody that can just stand in that gap. I can't can't be pulled all these different directions. And, and Jim and Patty walked in, and I said, they came in one Sunday when we were at the horse barn, and he walked in, and he said, Pastor Mance, he said, my name's Jim Hines. I said, hey, Jim, how are you? He said, I'm great. He said, uh, just retired to the area, looking forward to do a lot of fishing. I'm like, great. I said, so are, are you newly retired? Pretty new, yeah. I said, how are you doing with retirement? I need to stay busy. I got to have something to do. I don't know if I can fish all the time. I said, okay. I said, what, what do you do? What is your gifting? He said, well, actually, I've spent my entire career working in leadership development and training young leaders and, and corporate leadership and all these things. And I sat there and nearly started crying as I was meeting this person for the first time. That would have been weird. And so I didn't. Um, but through conversation, I actually believe over the last probably three, four years that they were here, um, I don't think Jim got much fishing done because he poured all of his time into you. And there's a quote by Isaac Newton that I think of anytime I think of somebody that's been a mentor in my life. And, and Jim has been one of those people where it says, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And I'm so honored to have known that giant in my life. Um, he was a good one. And it wasn't just his knowledge of leadership or knowledge of pastoring. It was just 
that he was a man after God's heart if you got to spend any time with him. I had an opportunity to see him in the hospital just briefly. And he was fighting with his mask. And he said, uh, he kept trying to take it off. I said, you can't take that off, Jim. You can't take it off. And he pointed at me. And he said, wait. I said, okay. And he took a big breath. And he pulled his mask up. And he said, he is here. And I am honored. And he put his mask back on. And he looked at me. And I said, okay. And I just sat there still for a minute. And he patted me again, and I said, yeah. He started to grab his mask. I said, you need to cut it out. You got to leave that on. And he looked at me, and he winked, and took another big breath. And he pulled that mask back, and he said, I love you being my pastor. Even in, even in his illest moments, some of you know this because you got text messages from him throughout his Time in the hospital. Even in his moments where he could hardly breathe, I watched him try to write notes and he would get through two words and his arms would drop. Even in his moments that he had nothing of himself to offer, he was pouring out into others. If you wonder what it is to be a godly person, if you wonder what it is to be a godly man, an encourager at all times and at all levels, I challenge you to take a look at the life of Jim Hines. You will be blessed for doing so. So those of you that have reached out to the family, thank you. There will be a memorial service, but it will be in March. They're going to let some of the weather clear, let some of the family be able to make some arrangements, and we will be doing that in March. We've started something here at Real Life in honor of Jim by request of Jim and his wife, Patty. Uh, Neither of them are flower people. Their words, not mine. Don't send any flowers. So we've started a Jim Hines Leadership and Scholarship Fund here at the church. You can give to that because that's what he was passionate about. Some of our leaders here at the church know that just because he poured into them. Um, So you can give to that just the same way you give otherwise. Texting, the number is 84321. You put your dollar amount and then the words Jim Hines. And it'll take care of it from there. It'll walk you through the process. So... I wanted to just share that with you guys. We're praying for Patty. Patty, if you're watching, know we're praying for you. We're lifting you up. And what an honor it was to know your husband. And what an honor it is to still have you with us, Miss Patty. So um, you guys, if you think about it, say a prayer this week for the Heinz family as they're walking through this time. Also, another announcement before I get into the sermon. i got to hurry because i got a lot to preach about this morning. We're going to talk about how women should love their husbands. Amen. March 7th, March 7th, God has blessed us, and you wouldn't know it maybe by looking around today, but God has blessed us. Uh, It's amazing what a vaccination will do, all right? So vaccinations started going out about a month ago, and as that has happened, our numbers have increased weekly by about 20 to 50 people, and we are increasing to the point where those that still struggle or maybe feel a little uncomfortable with crowds are feeling a little uncomfortable in both of our services, both our 930 and our 11 service. So here's what we're going to do on March 7th. We're going back to our three. Okay? Hey, hold, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me clarify this so that no one loses their mind later. 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. So these services, the 930 and the 11, are only going to need to shift half an hour. Then we will add an 8.30 service. At that 8.30 service, here's the kicker. At that 8.30 service, we're going to require mask. Okay? Thank you. Okay? <laughs> and somebody goes, why are you going to do that? You're bending. You're what? And, and I love all the political garbage. That, listen, I grew up watching churches do one service for a banjo and another service for an electric guitar. I grew up watching churches have one service where the choir wore robes and one service where the preacher wore flip-flops. We will divide or split or whatever you want to say for a ton of different reasons. And, and this is just because we have a lot of our real life folks that are aching to be together in a way that they feel comfortable. So somebody has called it the not so dirty 830. <laughs> so those of, you that, those of you that do say, hey, you know what, I understand, I get it. Here's the thing, church, please, I'll say this one time and I'll only say it one time and you can either love me or be mad at me. I can handle both. 
but we will not be a playground church. What I mean by that is we are not going to make snide comments. We're not going to make jokes. We're not going to make fun of. We're not going to do anything that would be disrespectful because someone else chooses to do something different than what you do, so long as it's not biblical. And let me just tell you, you won't find anything in the Bible about whether you should or you shouldn't wear a mask, regardless of what Facebook tells you. Okay, so that March 7th, 8.30 is going to be the not-so-dirty 8.30. We're probably not going to put that out on any cards. <laughs> just because they may really wonder about what the 10 o'clock and the 11.30 are about, if that's the case. So, um, but starting March 7th, 8.30, p- 8.30 a.m., not p.m., don't show up then, you'll be way late. Um, but that's going to be that service. You'll have more information in the coming weeks about it. Remember, this is the biggest thing. Every time we make an announcement, we either have people that don't hear a word we say when we make an announcement or people that assume that the moment we make an announcement, it means right now. Next week, if you show up at 8.30, you can help park cars because you're going to be early enough for the 9.30 service to do that. There won't be a service, all right? March 7th, starting with our our, our continuation of the Love on Purpose series, but that's going to be happening at the front end of March. So everybody good? All right, here we go. John chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Church, say love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, here's the key, by this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The whole idea of this series is to love on purpose. We want to make sure that, the, the, that our action of love has intentionality behind it. God loved us with a purpose in mind. God loved us. He came to this earth with a purpose in mind. Jesus Christ went to a cross with a purpose in mind. And so we will live our, our lives as believers in him and followers of him with a purpose in mind. So we wanted to dive in on the front half of this series and really talk through some relationship stuff because, I mean, good grief. Today is Valentine's Day. Hey, if you're here with your, your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend, I want you to look over at him and go, I love you. Now, not if you're not to that point yet. I don't want to put any pressure on you. Okay, if you're just like, if, the, if, if you came to Real Life Church on a first date, don't say it yet, all right? Don't say it yet, all right? You want to get into that. But it's, a, it's Valentine's Day. It's a great day. I hope you celebrate it. I hope you just have an amazing time today. But today, let's get to the real topic at hand. Last week, we talked about how men should love their wives. And we said, men, you need to do a couple things. You need, to, you need to listen to your wife. Wives, did that happen this week? Did your husbands, like, as soon as they got home, go, sweetie, can you just tell me everything you need to hear? That you need me to? Did that happen last week? Say amen, ladies, if it happened. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I still got the notes in my book, so we're just going to do that one over again since uh, we didn't see. said you need to not only listen, but you need to learn them. You need to learn them. Ask them questions. We're going to actually touch on that one again today uh, with the ladies towards the husband. Uh, It's an incredible idea or an incredible thought to learn your spouse. You say, well, I know them already. Ah, you might be surprised how little we know about one another. Uh, Jennifer and I laughed all this week because there was a phrase that she used that I just it just floored me again. And, and it was funny because I just talked about it, and then she used a phrase, and I'm like, where did that, did you like, I asked her, I said, did you, did you see that quote somewhere? And then like copy and paste it? She's like, no, that came from me. And I'm like, you never used that word. Like in the years we've been together, You've never used that phrase. And she said, so it means I can't use that phrase? No, I wasn't saying that. I'm just saying that it was unexpected. I didn't know what was going on. I'm still learning her. I'm still learning her. And so we're going to dive into that. Today, ladies, I want to just talk real quick about this. We're going to use the same scripture in Ephesians. And you can go there if you'd like, Ephesians chapter 5, where it just mentions, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it as a sacrifice so that he could present the church with spotless and unblemished. Wives, submit to your husbands. Give them respect is what the command to the wives is in that passage. So I'm going to give you just a couple things today. All right. As we talk through this. Men, how many of you are excited about the, the sermon today? Say amen. How many of you are scared to say amen? Okay. All right. So today... 
today we're going to talk this out. Today we're going to lay out where the ladies, what some things that would be beneficial for your marriage, for your relationships. First thing I need you to do is see men and women are different. Say amen. I know the world is telling us something different than that, but it's a very true statement that men and women are different. And since they're different, they, they give and receive things differently. Men require respect. They want, they want to feel like you respect them. You guys have heard me talk about this before uh, with a season in Jennifer and I's life when uh, we had been together and we had some steps that were falling apart. And I, I am not a handyman, but it's my house, so I'll figure it out. And, and I didn't figure it out because sometimes if it's not emergent to me, then it's not an emergency. Anybody understand that phrase? And so, like, I'm thinking it's fine because I got longer legs than everybody else. I can step over the step that's broken. But it was becoming an emergency to Jennifer, and I was like, I'll fix it. I'll take care of it. I'll handle it. And then she said, why don't you just call Kirby? Now, Kirby is probably, next to my wife, Kirby is one of my dearest friends, if not my dearest friend. He, we're great friends. He serves on the church staff with us here. We, we have went on vacation together. We, we, I love Kirby. He is my friend. Trust him with my entire world, I would. In fact, Kirby is one of the few people that he has the ability to hear at the church. He has, when Kirby walks into the room, when he speaks, it's as if I speak. So it's just like it came from the pastor, the lead pastor. That's how much I trust him. And, uh, but in that moment, when my wife wanted another man to fix the stairs in my house, I was not a fan. I'm like, what? She's like, just call Kirby. He'll fix it. I'm like, no. I'll fix it. So I went and got a box of screws and ran every screw in that box into that wooden stair to make sure it wouldn't move. Man, I stepped on it. I bounced on it. It didn't move. I was like, good, finally. Don't mention it again. We don't need no Kirby. Kirby. <laughs> Kirby. Who needs a Kirby right now? Two weeks later, I stepped on that step. <laughs> the whole thing buckled underneath me. I left it for another month. If you'll just, I don't know why you won't just call Kirby. Because I can't call Kirby. Because I'm a dude and he's a dude. And if I go, hey, can you tell him help me fix this dude stuff? And I should be able to do it, but I don't do it. There was a pride thing going in there, fellas. You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you'll let something rust away and disappear from existence simply because sometimes you just don't want to ask for help. We got the stair fixed, and, and I can't remember, it's been so long ago, I can't remember if we actually asked Kirby or I've just blocked it out of our mind because we did ask Kirby. <laughs> but we always joke about that because I told her, I said, it wasn't about fixing the stairs, it was about that you felt you needed to ask somebody else to do something I should do, and I felt disrespected. And in men and women, we receive love differently, what we would call love. And so it's important to know the different languages. So, so ladies, I want to give you some, some tips today. Hopefully that will be beneficial for you in, in, in walking through this. The first thing I want to tell you to do, and some of these are going to sound super spiritual, and, and, and it's okay that they do because they are spiritual. God joined you two together, knit you into one flesh. And so it's critical that you understand this. And so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to pray for your husband. Write it down, ladies. Pray for your husband. And be really careful here because here's what I don't mean. I don't mean you going, God, if you don't kill him, I'm going to. That is not what I'm saying. All right? I'm also not saying, Lord, if you'll just change this about him, then I will be happy. No. It's amazing to me what we will put on God to change that we picked originally. Because you said yes. You, you went on the first date and the second. And you walked down the aisle in the pretty white dress. So for you to then get in a relationship and be like, I just wish you'd do this differently. You should have mentioned that back here. <laughs> One single man goes, yeah. I'm sorry, Joe. The rest of the male population left you hanging on that one. <laughs> They're like, Shh, Joe, cut it out. 
But so often we tend to do that in relationships. We fall in love with something, some things, some picture of what we assume it might be. And then when maybe some of those things aren't, we get in it and then we start praying. But we're not praying the right prayers. We're praying that God would, would, would change them somehow. We've got, God, if you'd only make them like this. And, and what you probably ought to be praying is, God, make me like you would have me to be and make him like you would have him to be. Because let me just tell you straight up, God does a better job picking than you do. He does a better job picking than all of us do. We joke because we have a lot of kids, and I tell them all the time, sometimes when they call, hey, I want to go on a date with this person. Uh, Dad, can I start talking to this person? I still have a, I still have a deal. If you're going to date one of my daughters, you got to call me. you got to call me. It's, it's not even a, it's non-negotiable. We're not going to talk about it. If you're like, I don't want him to do that. And sweet, makes it easy for me. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> That's so unfair. Okay. <laughs> you see, fairness wasn't an option in the first place. If it was fair, I'd give my four-year-old the same allowance I give my 17-year-old. But that doesn't make sense, right? So stop saying it's got to be fair. It don't, parents. Don't live under that lie. We're going to talk about that next week in parenting. Okay. But I, I, it's a requirement. You call me. Why? Because most of the time in your teenage years, your picker's broke. <laughs> Say amen. amen. How many of you dated somebody in high school like now you're looking back going, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, God, that didn't work out. Woo! It would have been bad. Like you see him, like you see him in Walmart and you cart past him and you're like, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. <laughs> Am I right? Why? Because your picker's broke when you're young. You don't know. That's why you got to have people around you. That's why it doesn't have to be fair. But so often we get, we pick, and then we assume that if we, we work hard enough, we can change them. And that's incorrect logic. That doesn't make any sense. Marriage is an amplifier. All right? Any issue that was there before the marriage will only be amplified after the marriage if it's not addressed. And so we talk about, uh, one of the things I walk people through marriage counseling, pre-marriage counseling, one of the things I walk people through constantly is expectation versus reality because there is a gap in the middle called tension. So wives, you need to be praying for your husband. You need to pray daily. God, I would that you would be in his thoughts today, that you would be at the forefront of his thoughts today, that you would strengthen him and empower him and give him the courage to be the man that you would have him to be and give him the strength to make it through today. And thank you, God, for blessing me with him. But Vince, you don't know my man. No, but I know you picked him. And if you picked him, you ought to pray correctly for him. Don't pray at him. Don't pray to God at him. All right. Most of the times, issues that come up in marriage were issues that have always been there. They've just been covered by a few things that maybe didn't make sense. Maybe they, maybe they didn't show themselves fully. And we also get really good at showing our highlight reel. We're going to show the good stuff, right? I'll make sure I open the door for you on the first date. By the third date, you're like, you getting that? I understand, ladies, we, we're, we're a mess most of the time. How many of you men would testify that you're a mess most of the time? I'm not talking like an emotional mess. We, just don't, we, 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 we only have a mental capacity for so many things at one time. I'm not kidding. That's not funny. That's true. Ladies, you don't understand it because you're sitting there with a whole Rolodex of thoughts ripping off at the same time in your mind. You've got an entire internet happening up here just... And men are going, breakfast. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm like, like my friends, my guy friends, if I, if, I, if I see ladies do something, like, hey, we could do this. We, you want to get together? We'll watch a movie. We'll grab some food. We'll just bring it all to the house. We'll just do this. We'll do that. We'll do that. And they plan this whole thing out. If a guy calls me or he texts me, he's like, hey, you want to grab breakfast? We don't talk about where we're going. We don't talk about what time we're going to meet. That's always the first question. The rest of the details will work themselves out if there's an agreement. We don't need a big plan. We just need an initial step of activity. Yeah. <laughs> then it's on. Where are you going? Don't know yet. What are you eating? Mm -mm. 
It's okay though. That's why it's beautiful that it's that way. He said, I don't know if it's beautiful, Vince. I'm so stressed because I can't figure him out. Oh, that's the joy. I know, ladies, you're like, you said joy. Yeah, I know. It's, it's the fun part, but we're going to get to that in a second when we talk more about learning them. So ladies, pray for your husband. Pray, pray, pray. You say, I don't know what to pray for him. Pray Psalms 121, 7 and 8. If you want a verse to start with, the Lord will keep you. Lord, I pray that you keep him from all harm, that you will watch over his life, and that the Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. You want the best husband that God could possibly create for you? Pray for one that has the favor of God on him. The hand of God leading his life, his, his go, going and his coming, his, his morning and his evening. God, protect him, keep him from harm. And wherever he steps, you go with him, Lord. That's what I want for him today. Leave the fixing to God. Leave the directing to God. No offense, but he does a better job than you do. All right, And we struggle with that because we think a lot of times we know the remedy, we know the answer, and sometimes we don't. Ladies, second thing is this. See, that didn't take too long. Be careful of your words. Remember last week we said typically in a, in a normal household, women have all the words. They use more words. I think the number statistically is something like three to four times as many words a day as a man uses because you have this Rolodex thing happening in your mind, this full-blown worldwide web of information that you are trying to click through. My wife's phone, I, we, we joke all the time because my wife's phone is, there's always tabs open. If you go to the internet, there'll be, at any given moment, there'll be, you know, five to 25 tabs open in her internet browser. Because she's just, she's, that's the way she thinks. She's just wired to go, just, like, I can't help. I got to clear them out because then if I see it later, I'm like, why was that open? That doesn't make any sense because I've already forgot about what I was looking at. All right? There'll be like a video pop up of a cat playing tetherball with a gerbil. And I'm like, oh, I'm not watching that. I don't want to make no sense. But in hers, she remembers everything that she was looking at. And this is why I looked at it. And this is why it fits over here. And we need to do this. And we were talking about a vacation. And this might be cool over here. But you were talking about this at a church. And so I've got this tab over here. And I'm going, I can't do it. So my mind won't do it. I just can't get to that many places. But because ladies have so many more words, sometimes sometimes we got to be cautious of them. Now, this, now, I want you to understand, every, everything we're saying to men last week and ladies this week goes both ways. Please don't think this is a list that's split right down the middle. Men, if you have a problem with your mouth, pay close attention to this. Ladies, if you have a problem not filtering what you say, then pay close attention to this. This is what happened in the book of 2 Samuel. David had just David had just come back from a battle, and he is throwing, he is excited, he is celebrating, he's dancing down the middle of the street, people are cheering and parading, woo, David's home, and the, the, like the chant was this, David has killed his ten thousands, and Saul has killed his thousands, so like they're giving David representation above the king, like it's a parade, it is ticker tape, celebration in the street, and this is what David's wife was said to him, she said, uh, when David returned home to bless his own family, when he returned home to do what, church? To bless his own family. Michael, his wife, the daughter of Saul, came out and said in disgust, "Huh? how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar man might do. Nowhere in the scripture does it say David exposed himself to the servant girls. All it says is that he celebrated in the streets the victory that they'd won. But because of an insecurity on his wife's part, it turned it into disrespectful speech and a lying accusation. You have to watch your words. I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for passionate conversation in a marriage. It has to be. You have to have table moments where you just come to the table and it may be awkward and it may be hard but you have to have real conversations with your spouse uncomfortable conversations with your spouse but it doesn't mean you have to have unloving or disrespectful conversations with your spouse 
And in order to do that, you have to learn to watch your words. You have to learn to filter your words. But Vince, I get so angry sometimes. If you get like that, and this is going to hurt, but I got to say it because sometimes I get in trouble with it too. We cannot, we cannot, we must, Christians in the house, Christian couples in the house, you live under a different standard. The playground rules of you get loud so I get loud shouldn't apply to adults. That is not how we should function. Well, they made me mad. Well, then maybe time out is the best option. You say, that's offensive, Vince, just because I have a temper. We'll make excuses for our temper all day long. We'll say it's because of our heritage. We'll say it's because we're stressed out. We'll say, but the reality is the choice to express the temper is all on you. It's not because you're Irish. It's not because you're redheaded. It's not because you had a rough day at work. It's because you chose to allow the emotion overwhelm the moment. That's what happens. And so both sides got to watch your words. There are some really funny scriptures in, in the Bible about a woman and her quarreling. I don't know if you've ever seen these. I'm not going to preach these today, but I had to read them to you because they're pretty interesting. And husbands, it may give you some ammunition to try if you're looking forward to a funeral. <laughs> Hope you caught all that, what I just said. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9 says, It is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in the house shared with a quarrelsome wife. You good down there? I got a wife really giggling down here. Have you used that, Jeremy? No, yeah. <laughs> Chrissy said, no, he hasn't. 27.15 says, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. <laughs> now listen, when I read this stuff and I'm like, I would never say something like that to my wife. I would never say that, even if we were quarreling, even if, if there was something that I'd done that had frustrated her. And I would never say something. But Saul like, wrote the book. like He wrote Song of Solomon. Like, so he wrote it like this is the love story of love stories. And that's what he wrote in there. That's what he wrote in Proverbs as far as wisdom goes. And guys, it can go either way. Watch your words. Be cautious of what you say. For the last thing, we're going to spend some more time on this, so i got to get there. So it goes back into the, the loving thing, all right? So when we talk about loving or learning one another, how many of you husbands know your wife's birthday? Say amen. amen. How many of you know what day it was, actually, the year she was born? <laughs> okay, all right. Me neither, all right? So... Um, I'm so glad you all said no. I was going to feel really bad. Oh, yeah, it was Tuesday, Pastor Vince. Dang it, that didn't work. Um, but what I want to ask you, is there anybody in the room right now that speaks a different language, that has the ability to speak a different language? Come on up. Come here. I need your help. Fantastic. You can jump. Yeah. Well, I mean, you may be able to jump. If I jumped, it would be more like a roll. In, it wouldn't be good. So you speak Spanish. All right. So, I want you to say something in Spanish. Um, Anything. Buenos dias. Como okay. están? Good job. Who has no idea whatsoever how to speak Spanish? Maria, come here. No? <laughs> Never mind. This got shot down right there. Any, anybody else don't have any idea? I, I, I need somebody that doesn't have an, any idea. I need a female that doesn't have any idea how to speak Spanish. You don't? Come on up. Come here. Yeah, there are stairs. I mean, you guys can take stairs if you want. It's okay. It's all right. So what's your name? Ernie. Ernie. Good to see you again, Ernie. And your name? Shanae. Shanae. All right. Shanae, Ernie, do you guys know each other? No. This is Ernie. Ernie, this is Shanae. Okay. All right, Ernie, you married? No. No. Okay, Shanae, you married? No. Perfect. All right, I need you to stand right here. I need you to stand on that black dot right there. So, here's what I'm going to do. I got three things right here. I got a bottle of water, I got a rose, and I got candy. All right? Or a cake. I don't know if I call it a candy. All right, so, um, you hold these. Okay. Got them? 
Okay, so Ernie, without saying anything at all, other than which of those items you want her to give you, but I need you to say it in Spanish. Asking her for the item. I want you to ask her for the item in Spanish. It's just one, just only pick one, okay? All right. Uh, Me podrías dar la rosa, por favor? <laughs> so hold on, hold on. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to give him what he asked for. I don't know. Just try it. Okay. Just come back here. Come back here. Ernie, did she get it right? It was a good guess, yeah. Yeah, it's a good guess, right? <laughs> All right. So now she got two more things in her hands. All right? So I want you to ask again for something that she has. Okay? Uh, ahora la botella de agua, por favor. Do you know what he said? Do you know? Just, just pick one. It's your call. Okay, so go back right here. So how'd she do? Uh, wrong on this wrong one. Wrong on this one. So I know you're like, oh, but she gave him cake? She gave him, a, I mean, it's even heart-shaped, isn't it? Sweet, but he asked for agua. Yeah, I thought I heard that. And some of you all did too. Shh. Do you see what happened here? You were trying, right? You wanted to give him what he wanted, what he was asking for. But if you don't understand, it's, it's this. It, did you notice how she walked over here? Like, I hope I'm giving you the right thing. And sadly, this happens in relationships when we don't know one another's language. It's not going to be Spanish or English or Portuguese or French or anything like that. Okay, he asks for those two things, so you get the water and he gets the rose and the cakes, all right? So you can take those with you. You guys give it a hand to these guys right here. Thank you guys for helping me out, all right? You can take it with you. So often in marriage, because we don't take the time to learn the language of the other person, we spend a lot of time in the early part of marriage and even long time into our marriage just kind of walking slowly across the room to each other going, I hope I'm getting this right. I hope I'm getting this right. And then sometimes it's received and we go, Phew. like Ernie says, well, it's a lucky guess. It was a good guess. She got that one. Okay, because the flower came and, 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 and she got that one. Now, she may have heard a portion. She may have heard a little something that sounded like rose. And so she's like, I'm going to go with rose. I'm going to just take a leap of faith here and try. And you go, but isn't that how relationships are, Pastor Vince? Isn't it just a leap of faith? No. No, it's learning the language. The reality, there's a book that came out a few years back by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, several of you do. All right. How, how many of you know what your love language is? Hands up. If you know it, put it up. All right. All right. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, maybe you've heard of it, but you do not know what your love language is, put your hand up. Okay. Awesome. Some of you don't know, and you're not going to put your hand up no matter what I say. All right. This idea is that men and women, we receive love differently, but each individual man and each individual woman even receive it differently. And he breaks it down into five different love languages, ways that if I was to speak a language with somebody, they could understand me and I could understand them so long as they spoke the same language. And so he gives us just like if, if you had somebody that spoke French here and somebody that spoke French here, guess what they get to have that nobody else gets to have? Because none of us speak French, obviously. They get to have a conversation. They get to have a conversation that's not only just words, but it's also understanding. And so with that understanding comes intimacy, and with intimacy comes joy and happiness and all those different things in marriage. Now, I'm not saying just sex is intimacy. I'm just talking intimacy, a closeness that only God can provide only happens when communication is both given, received, and understood. It's the only way that it can happen. The problem is most of us speak different languages. Most people speak different languages in regards to their love language. The five love languages are this. I'm going to go ahead and walk through them. First one is physical touch. Now, these aren't in order. Physical touch. If I were to ask, how many of you think, yep, my love language is physical touch? Raise your hand. Got a few, okay. Typically, what I've heard in the past was, yeah, physical touch is always on a man's love language. But you need to understand physical touch doesn't necessarily mean sex. 
And you're like, what? Wait a minute, then I retract my answer, Pastor Vance. <laughs> Physical touch can mean simply, uh, my, my top love language or second love language is physical touch. And so I'm a huge, I like, I will get out of the car and I always walk usually just a step ahead of Jennifer, not because of dominance or she better call me Lord and Master or anything like that. I just, when I get out of the car, I typically am a few steps ahead of her. And without fail, I do this. And she always grabs my hand. And I know. It's just a touch. It's just, I'm right here. And that's all I need. I'm good. When we're sitting in the car, if she reaches across the car and pats me on the leg or rubs my shoulder, I'm good. If we lay down at night, just as I go to sleep or just as I'm about to go to sleep, she rolls over and rubs my shoulder or says, hey, good night. I'm good because there's a physical aspect of it. It doesn't mean we just made love or it doesn't mean anything like that occurred. It just meant that she was there and she took the time to physically touch me, to physically reach out. So there's physical touch. Some of you go, yeah, I think that may be mine. Well, let's keep going because you may find some other ones here. The second one is quality time. Quality time is pretty self-explanatory. It's time where you shut off the phones, you make sure the kids are away or asleep, and it's just you two. You're going to watch your show together. You're going to have a conversation together. You're going to get coffee in the morning, and you're not going to answer the church call, the business call, the work call, the kid call. My kids are used to me denying their phone calls. I love them all, but I had my ones that have moved out for 18 years. They can give me a minute, so I don't answer them. They know. They send me texts. They mean texts. Oh, you don't love me anymore. You're right. I don't love you for the next 25 minutes because I'm with your mom. I'll love you when that's over. I'll call you then. Quality time where you set aside. It's not quantity time because there's a real life that happens. And you got to be intentional about the quality time where you set it aside. Hey, we're going to go on a date night. Hey, we're going to sit down. This is going to be our show. I don't know how many of you have a show. I don't know how many of you have quality time. But how many of you would say right now, that, hey, Pastor Vince, I think just by hearing some of that, that my love language is quality time. Hands up. That's you. Okay, awesome. I'm already seeing some differences. Next one, words of affirmation. This is my number one. For me, but it's specific because see, words of affirmation from everybody doesn't make sense. It's got to be specific people that you know and respect and have care for in your life, and it matters to you what they say. Words of affirmation simply mean that every once in a while you need to be told or you need to hear, hey, you're doing all right. Hey, that was really great what you did. I love the way you, man, thanks so much for being mine. Hey, I, I just, I wanted you to know this, and it's that affirming conversation. I know some of you right now are like, man, I really need that in my life. And some of you are in the room right now are like, big baby, he needs to be told that all the time. Because they're different love languages. And it's, it's literally the same thing as putting somebody that speaks French over here and somebody that speaks Portuguese over here and going, hey, y'all figure this thing out. Y'all make it work. Well, your intentions may be really good, but they don't understand. And your intentions may be really good, but they don't understand. And so you're going to clash. Fourth one is gifts. Some of you receive love by gifts. Today is your day. Anybody get flowers this morning when they woke up? Got one. Wow, fellas. You really didn't listen last week, did you? <laughs> But you may be married to somebody that's not a gifts person. Jennifer's not a gift. She likes gifts. And there are several other people I know, several other ladies, I know they like gifts, but like flowers to them, they're like, they're going to die. I don't need no flowers. Don't give me no flowers. That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, it depends on the gift. If you give your wife flowers, she goes, flowers are going to die. If you give her a trip to Mexico, she may be like, oh, that's quality time. That's not a gift. And so the love language changes. So gifts is a simple one. Some people receive gifts. And you can always tell because you go, this, all of you were thinking about how you receive love. Yes, I'm a gifts person. Or I'm a physical touch. I need physical touch. I need words of affirmation. I need these things in my life. But it's interesting. Let me get through the last one and then I'm going to unpack it some more. Last one is acts of service. The ladies in the house. Uh -huh. I love acts of service. How many of you ladies would rather have your husband do the dishes than buy you flowers? 
Okay. Wow. She just, just threw you right under the bus. You and Joe need to come in and meet with me after church because you're a little vocal on some pieces there. Acts of service. Help. Help. It's the gift in the Bible that's a helps gift. This is the thing that, man, they, this is how they are wired is to help people, but also it's how they receive is to receive help. So you've got these five love languages, physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, uh, the gifts, and, and the, the acts of service. You have these five languages. So now you've got five options here to sp- try to speak with each other. But if you don't know what the other person's is, you know what you're going to do? You're going to try to love them with your language. How many of you have ever tried to, anybody ever traveled to a foreign country? And you get in the airport, and you know what you do instinctively? You talk louder and slower. As if louder, slower English makes sense to someone who doesn't speak it anyway. We went to Mexico a few years back, Kirby and I did, and man, I have made this comment in sermons before, and I couldn't help it. I get there, and the lady who's at the Starbucks in Mexico City is trying to tell me what to order, asking me what I want to order, and I'm like, I want grande caramel latte. And they're just looking at me, and I'm wondering, why is this strange white man screaming at me? <laughs> but that's all I knew to do is to say it louder, more pronounced. You do the same thing with your love language. If you don't know the other persons, you will attempt to love them louder and more pronounced in your love language. And you may be pouring out gifts on them, and they're like, this is the dumbest thing in the world. And then your heart breaks because you don't get the love that you were pouring out reciprocated. Why? Because you didn't speak their language. Your intentions were good, but they didn't understand. They didn't understand. So when I say love your spouse or learn your spouse, this is not biblical, okay? Listen, the book on marriage is Genesis through Revelation. That's the best book on marriage you will ever find, I promise you. But this is really beneficial to help you in that journey, to be able to know, hey, I need... I need to know what language you speak. I need, because here's the thing. Same way in your marriage, and I took you back here last week in our first scripture that says this, that a, a new commandment I give you to love one another. Love one another. They will know you are mine if we love one another. You know, the reason so many people have either walked away from the church or refused to step in the doors of the church is because we stop speaking their love language. We speak this churchy version. And I say churchy intentionally. That almost feels judgmental. Feels cold. And I want them to know that we are His, but in order for them to know that we are His, we have to speak His love language. That says, I poured it out no matter what. I poured it out no matter what. I knew you were broken. I knew you were flawed from the cross. And I still looked ahead and I still died for you. And I still gave everything for you so that you would have it shot. Do you love the world outside? Do you speak that love language to the lost in this world? I want your marriage to be great. And I want you to learn each other's love language. In fact, I'm going to do this for you right now. Is there a couple in the room right now? Just I need a couple that does not know one another's love language. Hands up if that's you. You guys right here? Come on, come here. Now here's the next part. You actually got to read the book. All right? You read it together. And you'll laugh at each other, but you're also going to learn something about each other. There's a quiz in the back where you take and it'll tell you what your love language is. All right? So go ahead and read that. But guys, you, jump online. Go figure it out. And then, then go, holy moly, I've been missing this for years. I'm physical touch and I'm words of affirmation. My wife... It's quality time and acts of service. Of the five languages, we speak four different ones. And it takes work. It takes work. Sometimes I want to hug, and she doesn't feel like hugging because she's trying to do an act of service over here. She's trying to help somebody, and I want to hug. I just need a hug. Why don't you stop and hug me anymore? (laughs) I'll tell her. I tell her, early in our marriage, I used to tell her I love her. I said, baby, I love you. I love you. I love you. I would tell her I love her easily 30 to 40 times a day. 
I know some of you are like, oh, that's so sweet. And some of you are like, <laughs> It's a love language thing. Because finally one day she stopped me and she said, I got a question. I'm like, what? She's like, do you think that I don't know? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you, just, you say I love you. Like, it's like almost if you don't have something else to say, you just drop that in there. So I'm starting to wonder about the sincerity of it or if you just fill in time by saying, I love you, babe. I love you, babe. And I was, I was shocked and offended. I'm like, I'm professing my love to you. And she's like, I know you love me. I don't, I don't need to hear it all the time. You know what we had at that moment? We had a language breakthrough. Because what I told her was, is, hey, I'm a words of affirmation person. I need to hear it from time to time. Even if you don't need to hear it, I do need to hear it. And so now we're starting to figure out how to communicate with each other. Where if I know her day has been long and I'll run home and I may throw together something for dinner and it's usually not spectacular if I throw it together. But I'll try to throw something together for dinner and I'll try to make sure that I get the dishes done and I'll go run her a bath or whatever it is and I don't say, hey, now that I've done all that thing, here we go. No, that's not the purpose of it. My purpose is that I want to speak her language and right now for her to know that she is loved means I have to do these things or I want to do these things on her behalf. Husbands, learn your wives. Wives, learn your husbands. The journey is much more fun when you choose to do that. When you choose to do that. I'm going to pray for you real quick and I'm going to turn it over. Father, today, I ask that you would show us how to be more like you. That we would love one another. I've got to thank you for friends that just today showed up because they knew I was hurting. Because they knew I'd lost a friend. And they came and they just showed they are yours by their love. Lord, I pray in our marriages we'd show the world we are yours by how we love our spouses. God, that it would make perfect sense that we could trust to Savior so well because He's living in us and through us. Teach us, God, how to love on purpose. Teach us, husbands, how to learn our wives and to listen to them. God, teach the wives how to learn their husbands and to pray for them. God, and to pray that your will would be done in our lives. And Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.